In this discussion, we will be having one of the most important foundational topics in organic chemistry. And I'm saying that because before we even proceed to most other basic properties of organic compounds, we have to know this one. And here, we need to go all the way back to uh, very general concepts in introductory chemistry classes because we're going to talk a lot about orbitals and quantum numbers. Okay, so as we know, if we go back to the electron configuration of carbon, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Knowing that, if I add all of the electrons here above, the sum is 6, which is the atomic number of carbons, which is equivalent to the number of protons, then equivalent to the number of electrons. All I want to say is that we have 6 electrons for a single carbon atom, and they are not placed equally around the carbon atom's nucleus. As you see, we, we should recall that there are what we call, uh, first of all, energy levels. And then after the energy levels, we have the sublevels. I mean, that's the reason why we have the numbers here. The 1 and the 2 stand for the energy levels. That's called the principal quantum number. And the S and the P letters stand for the sublevel. In quantum numbers, that's the azimuthal. And uh, when we place our orbitals, specifically the, the valence, which I'm going to highlight here in yellow, remember that we can write it down as boxes or sometimes as lines as you can see in this part. We should remember that there is only one s orbital for every s sublevel and for the p we have three p orbitals actually. And then we should plot them out or write them down in the orbitals. First the two orbitals of the two s valence could be conveniently put here and then the two electrons from the 2p can be placed like this. Take note that we are putting the electrons from the p separately because we are following what we call the Hunt's rule. For purposes of shortening the discussion, I'm not going to explain the Hunt's rule completely here. If you want to know more about it, you can go back to other introductory discussions on the quantum numbers. But now, what we see here is what we call the ground state. And... Uh, most of the time, when we talk about carbons in organic chemistry, we're, we're not really talking about the ground state. Okay. Now, in order to justify that or to make sense of that, remember that from previous discussions, I already made it clear that carbon has the capability to form four bonds. Now, I'm going to borrow a, a, an idea from um, other branches of chemistry. Actually, this is basically applicable to all branches. And uh, we have what we call the molecular orbital theory. I'm not going to discuss this completely here, but I want to say that, uh, for example, I want to make a bond. Let's say I, I have this carbon and I have this other carbon, or, or maybe I could make it even smaller. Let's say I have two hydrogens, and I want them to bond together. It's as if we're looking at one hydrogen's orbital with one electron and then the other hydrogen's orbital with also one electron and in order for these to combine they must merge we form two types of orbitals this is called the antibonding we don't we're not going to discuss this in this discussion or in this topic but i want to say that in order to make a bonding pair you actually need two orbitals with one electron so that when they combine, it will be one orbital with two electrons, which makes it a legitimate bond. And I'm just, I just want to say that this is a requirement. If you want to have a bonding orbital, you must have a orbital, an orbital with one unpaired electron. And if you're going to be asked, hey, how many of these can you see in the ground state? Well, I see Px and Py. So does that mean that I only see this, carbon can only form two bonds because this one cannot form a bond. This one cannot form a bond. So, of course, we know that that is not true because we just said a while ago that carbon has four bonds and not two. So, of course, we must assume that there's something going on. And that is to assume that carbon can actually absorb energy and go to the excited state. Where in one of these, or, uh, one of these electrons from the S, jump to the p orbital so this one would go to this pz orbital that was empty a while ago and now what we see after is that in the excited state 
we have not just one, not just two, but four unpaired orbitals. And that now confirms that we have the capacity to form four bonds for carbon. However, in order for us to completely understand how carbon bonds, we don't need to know only um, how many bonds are present, but also what type of bonds or overlaps are there. In order to refresh us on this detail, remember that originally, what we should know about S and P orbitals is that they, act, they have actual shapes. And in order to really get a hold of this, we need to know what type of overlaps can occur between two orbitals. I'm talking about, oh, the wrong slide. I'm talking about sigma and pi, okay? So first, we should recall that S orbitals have this kind of spherical shape, right? And uh, P orbitals have a somewhat uh, weird shape. It looks li li literally like an infinity symbol if it was two-dimensional. Some call it a dumbbell. I don't personally think it looks like a dumbbell. I've never used a dumbbell like this, but they call it a dumbbell shape. And sigma uh, bonding is said to be a head-on overlap. So that means like if I have, let's say, two uh, sigma orbitals here, I mean two s orbitals, they can meet each other or collide to each other head on. And then when they do collide, they share, when you say overlap, that means they are, their spaces kind of mix. So like if this is the space of one s and this is the space of the other s, then together they eat up both of those spaces and they look like a larger sphere. Okay, So that is what we call a head on overlap. And uh, this is actually the first bond in every bond, I mean, between two atoms. The sigma bond is always the first bond formed, okay? So for example, let's say I have a carbon-carbon single bond, and I know that a single bond is technically the first bond between two carbons. I mean, what could be the first, right, other than the single bond? Okay, Can, you cannot call the single bond here a second bond because it's the only one there, right? And that means that this one is pretty much a sigma bond, okay? And it's said to be a strong overlap simply because if I want to make a sigma bond, the electrons are actually nearer to the nucleus. Uh, I cannot completely show that here because my drawings are not really good. But uh, long story short, the sigma bond is said to be a stronger type of overlap as compared to the pi bond. And so if you look at the pi bond, the, this is said to be a sideway overlap. So when we say sideway, it's like the part of the p orbital we're trying to collide with each other is are these, you know, what you call sides, okay? And then when they do overlap, it's as if they, their sides kind of mix. And then uh, it doesn't really look like this perfectly. And when I try to shade all of this, when I try to shade all of this, it looks like this. Or maybe if I refine it a little further, the pi bond actually looks like a tooth. But actually, it's made up of, you know, two teeth, okay? Because the pi orbital, or the p orbitals, will uh, occupy this upper part as well as this lower bar part. So don't be fooled. This, these two teeth-like drawings only represent a single pi bond. Okay, as opposed to what people may actually think of that this may be two bonds. No, this is just a single bond. And now, if we're going to put it in a graphical way, uh, let's say I have a double bond. So we know that the first bond is always the sigma. So definitely anything after the sigma, which is the green one here, is now called a pi bond. So that actually tells us that a double bond is composed of one sigma, and then, of course, the other one is a pi bond. And so this is how it looks like if we're going to consider the actual shapes. So we know that the sigma bond already came first. It's the first bond between these two carbon atoms. And so that is the space taken by the sigma bond. And then now, I put my pi bond above and below the sigma bond. And again, let me repeat. This below and above spaces occupied do not represent two bonds. They are just a single bond. 
Okay, so that is what a double bond looks like. And there is a consequence of this one. The fact that the pi bond dominates or occupies the upper part as well as the lower part restricts movement of the double bond. So there, I will write here restricted movement. And that's not really important for now, but when we discuss isomers, this will be more important. Now, when we go to a triple bond, it's pretty much an extension of the double bond, simply because, simply because originally we already know that the sigma bond is always the first bond only. Okay, there's only one that should be first, and then the other two bonds should be pi. So that means the composition of a triple bond is 2 pi and then 1 sigma. We know that this is the one here at the center, if we're going to draw the actual thing, is a sigma bond. But then how about the two pi bonds? The first pi bond is the one we already drew a while ago, which is this above and below. But the second pi bond will now have to be perpendicular because it's there's no other space that's possible to be taken. So the second pi bond is actually as if it's lying down. So this is the one of the lobes or one of the halves of the second pi bond. And then this little thing at the back is the other half. So like, yeah. So if I'm going to color the second pi bond um, with a different color, the second pi bond would be this one lying flat at front and then the other one at the back. And then after this, what we should now know is that we're going to try to understand the dynamics of carbon because it's weird. How is it possible that sometimes a carbon has no pi bond, sometimes one pi, I mean one pi, this is what I should be talking about, and sometimes two pi? Because that's kind of a dilemma or a mystery for us right now.